It's Christmas. Have you noticed? Is it Christmas? Because if you look around, you will see that it's happy holidays, that it's season's greetings, that it's Xmas. Just about every possible way the world around us wants to remove the name from the season. Not the mass, the Christ. As you're all well aware, it came from Christ Mass, gathering together with communion for the celebration of the Lord's birthday. That's where it came from. That's the origin of Christmas. Coca-Cola tried to hijack it for an advertising campaign along the way. They took the image of St. Nicholas, who was a nice guy that gave presents to kids at Christ Mass time. They gave him a red coat because Coca-Cola has red as its feature colour. They made him fat and they thought they'll make him jolly because apparently drinking lots of Coca-Cola makes you jolly. So Father Christmas was invented by Coca-Cola and he has taken control of the celebration. Now I've got no problem with pictures of Santa around the place. I have no problem at all with blokes dressed up in red costumes with cotton wool beards. M making joy for children. I think that's wonderful. I have no problem with that at all. But for me, Christmas is about Christ. Why did he come? If you look at Jesus' life, it was not one of these. It was not a fun life. If you can believe some of the uh, American televangelists, Everything about being a Christian either makes you wealthy, makes you healthy, or makes you happy. Have you noticed that often when you're a Christian, you are not wealthy, you are not always happy, and you are not always well? If we only come to God to get from Him something to make us feel a little better in this age, we don't understand what it means to be born again. We're going straight around the Jesus and reaching for the Santa. Job is a good illustration of someone who loves in spite of, not because of, the perceived blessings of Jesus Christ. Does that mean that Jesus doesn't bless us? Of course it doesn't. God is constantly blessing us. But I don't know about you, I'm not walking with Jesus so I can be blessed. It's because I'm walking with Jesus, an automatic side benefit of that is that I am blessed. Does it always mean I'm happy? Ask Kathy. If she gives you an honest answer. <laughs> but I'm born again. Because I know what Jesus came for. And if there's anything that's worth thinking about on this weekend where we've just passed Christmas, missed it by one day, it's what did Jesus come for? Jesus Christ is God's greatest gift to the world. What comes through Jesus is the only hope we have of ever seeing the Father in a nice way. I do not want to see the wrath and the vengeance of God on someone who so soundly and roundly deserves it. Because I do. And guess what? I'm not the only one in this room who deserves the wrath of God. Because so much of my past life, and if I'm completely honest with you, every now and again, my present life, so much of it is offensive to the standard that God has set. And if it wasn't for the precious gift of life that is in Jesus Christ, I would be sunk. Let's have a look at the book of John. Chapter 3. A man named Nicodemus.
came groveling up to see Jesus after dark. He groveled up after dark because he didn't want to be caught talking to Jesus. What would his friends think? It's interesting, I've noticed oftentimes people, when you, as we had a couple of testimonies this morning, you offer to pray for them. Kathy and I did this recently with a gentleman that lives not far from where we are. We walk past his house most days with our two pugs, taking them for their morning walk. And this guy is quite often out in the front yard. On this particular occasion, he engaged us in conversation. Conversation went something like this. Good morning. G'day, I've got cancer. It affects some people that way. Kathy, not to be phased, said, oh, we'll pray for you. The guy literally looked up the street, <laughs> down the street. Uh, what do you mean? Well, we believe that God can heal. We'll pray with you. Uh, <laughs> not just now. I don't want to be seen talking to those crazy Christians. I don't want to be seen being prayed for. Some people, as, as Beth shared this morning, oh, I'm not having, I'm not having, I don't want what she's having. I want something completely different. I want a doctor to come along in a white coat and throw some tablets at me and everything will be fine. Because people are embarrassed to talk about Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to say Happy Christmas or Merry Christmas because it might offend somebody. Do you know there is only one entity on earth who is genuinely offended by the name of Jesus Christ and his name is Satan. He's offended because Jesus is his nemesis. Jesus defeated him on the cross. Jesus beat him completely. So when people come sliding up quietly at night or in a gymnasium, Phil, over in a corner where no one can hear them and they want to have a little talk about Jesus. Nicodemus came in the dark of night, but he came the right way and he came to the right person. I don't care how people come to talk about Jesus Christ as long as they come to talk about Jesus Christ. And I'm sure Phil doesn't care whether they accost him in his music studio. I suppose that won't happen anymore, now you're not singing. Whether they accost him at the, at the gymnasium or on the street, wherever it may come, if someone wants to talk about Jesus Christ, they've come for the right thing. But have you noticed, most people will always choose the worst time for you. If you notice when you're tired... That's when they'll come, want to start a conversation. Or you've desperately got to get somewhere. That's when they'll want to start the conversation. Or you're hungry and you really want to get some tucker. That's when they'll start the conversation. And I really think God up in heaven folds his hands across his tummy and laughs his head off sometimes. Let's just, let's just test them and see whether they're really out there. I'm beginning to think now that times are the least appropriate for someone to come. If I see them coming, I think to myself, here we go. Get ready. Nicodemus. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. There is an admission from a Jewish leader that Jesus is first and foremost a teacher, and secondly, that he's a worker of miracles. He knows more than the high priest does. He knows more than everyone else on the Sanhedrin does because he is prepared to admit this Jesus is someone special. And I want to know why. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's the first time you've heard this expression, born again. And Nicodemus is scratching his head. Have you noticed sometimes when God does speak to you, you scratch your head. What on earth are you trying to say? I am sure God has got a fantastic sense of humour simply because of the way, well, look at me for a start. He made me this way. But also the way he chooses to present himself to us at times. 
He comes in such an impossible way. You must be born again. Poor old Nick is scratching his head. What does that mean? And he answers, as you or I probably would, can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked, surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Ladies, how many of you would like for your children to have a second go at being born when they're probably up into their 30s or thereabouts? <laughs> well, Nicodemus has asked a reasonable question. How can I be born again? except by going back through the womb. Jesus now gives him the answer. I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone born of the spirit. The Holy Spirit can't be seen any more than God can be seen, but by golly, you can experience his works. I don't need someone to try to prove to me that the wind is there. I just stand in it and I feel it tossing my golden locks around. <laughs> well, I had golden locks until my wig blew off. <laughs> it's there. And the Spirit of God is there. And the power of God is there. And the only way we don't know it is by folding our arms and saying, I refuse to believe. I've met so many people like that. God doesn't try to hide himself from us. We try to hide ourselves from God. Let me just digress here just for a moment. This whole thing about being born again or being saved, there are expressions that have come into our language primarily, if not entirely, from our friends and brothers and sisters in America that are so unscriptural. One of the beauties is that the concept of receiving Jesus... That is so utterly, ridiculously, laughably unscriptural. You don't receive Jesus. Jesus receives you. Who's the king and who's the groveling servant? If the Queen of England was coming, I wouldn't say I may choose to receive Elizabeth at home. Elizabeth would say, I may choose to receive Francis. <laughs> I have no idea why she would want to do that, but it would not be my choice. Do you understand? When we say, oh, would you like to receive Jesus as your saviour? What we are saying is, would you like to do Jesus a colossal favour and from your point of authority and magnificence, allow him to enter into you. Because that's not the born-again experience. The born-again experience is us entering into Jesus. All right? So you'll never hear me say, would you like to receive Jesus? But what you might hear me say is, Jesus would love to receive you. The other one is this whole concept of the believer's prayer. That one was invented by Billy Graham back in the 50s, 60s. Sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer. Sorry, I said believer's prayer, didn't I? Believers have lots of prayers. The sinner's prayer. Here, just recite this prayer and you'll be a Christian. Show me anywhere in the Bible where it says recite this prayer and you'll be a Christian. It's not in there. What the Bible tells us we have to do is confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. Now, the choice of words you use for that, you may not even use words. 
If you have to pray a sinner's prayer to get born again, guess what? I'm not saved because I've never done it. I sat in a meeting not unlike this one and the preacher out the front was talking about Jesus Christ as Saviour and he was presenting a very reasonable case that without Jesus Christ, you are lost. With Jesus Christ, you have everything. Take the pittance that is your life now and give it to him and he will build you into someone who is useful and someone who has a future and a destiny and someone who others will maybe follow. That sounded good to me. So I sat there in my chair in the meeting and said, Jesus, I surrender to you. Take me and do what you will. That was it. I didn't even tell the bloke out the front. But on the way out of the church, I turned to Kathy and said, what do I do now? And she stood there with the look of a stunned mullet. And she said, did you just give your life to Jesus? And I said, yeah. She picked herself up off the floor and we've advanced from that point forward. The transaction is not just the words. The transaction is your heart and your head saying, Jesus, you are kurios. You are supreme. You are the ultimate. By the way, why is it so important that they want to take the name of Jesus or Christ out of everything? It's because the name of Jesus Christ is the only name by which we can be saved. Here's a revelation for you. You are not, never were, never could be saved by the Holy Spirit. Here is another one. You're going to start throwing yonis at me for this one. You are not, never were, and never could be saved by the Father. You were saved by Jesus Christ and by Jesus Christ alone. God has chosen to present himself to us in three discrete, separate, identifiable ways, forms. I have no idea how God can be on earth as the Spirit and still be in heaven. I have no idea how God can be on earth as Jesus Christ and still be in heaven and still be the Holy Spirit. But I accept because the Bible tells me that it's so, that it's so. Because I'm not God, how can I understand how God's mechanical sections work? I can't, but I can believe it. And the part of God that gave me life is Jesus Christ. So don't be ashamed, don't be afraid to use the name of Jesus, but always use it with great reverence and respect. Because it is his name that has brought us salvation. Uh, there's a sort of a thing running through the churches now, and I think, again, it's come from America. It's not entirely bad, but it makes me uncomfortable. People are now so frequently referring to God as Father, and that's it. Father gave me this, Father gave me that, Father did this, Father showed me that. Do you know what? It's Jesus. Don't be afraid to say, Jesus gave me this, Jesus gave me that, Jesus took me here, Jesus took me there. Yes, you do have a Father in heaven. And you can address him, guess what? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, when you pray, ask how? In my name. We go to the Father through Jesus. Why do we go to the Father through Jesus? Because it's Jesus who cleansed us and qualified us to be there. And the Father looks at us through Jesus and sees us as perfect. Now that doesn't mean you can't talk to Father God. But please, don't fall into this trap of everything is Father because most things are Jesus. It's Jesus who died for you, not Father God, Jesus God. It's Holy Spirit God who is in you. 
but it's Jesus God who brought you salvation. Please don't be afraid or ashamed or careless enough not to use Jesus' name. It's at the name of Jesus that demons flee. It's at the name of Jesus that we get life. I could go for hours on the name of Jesus, and I'm going to stop in a moment. You're born again when you receive what Jesus has done for you, when you place your life into his hands, allow him to place his spirit into you. Why is the Holy Spirit here? He is our parakletos. He is our comforter, our counsellor, our guide. When you hear that still small voice of God speaking in your mind, guess whose voice you're hearing? It's not the voice of Jesus. It's not the voice of the Father. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. We can get careless in our relationship with God if we don't understand there are three Parts of God and each has a function and each is vital. But I really do believe that God is, uh, God is determined that we address him in ways that are appropriate. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. Show me in the scripture where it says pray to the Holy Spirit. Nowhere. Absolutely Nowhere. Trust me, I've read this about 65 or 70 times now. Nowhere is there any instruction to pray to the Holy Spirit. Nowhere. Well, who do we pray to? Yes. In the Old Testament, they prayed to Jehovah. In the New Testament, we pray to Jesus. And through Jesus, we reach the Father. Father doesn't mind if you come directly to him, but normally and ordinarily the pathway that we have to our God is through Jesus Christ. Don't speak to the Spirit. Speak to the Father through Jesus. The Spirit will speak to you and he's well able to make himself heard. I'm going to stop because otherwise we'll be here until lunchtime. I might pick this up next time. But please be aware the name of Jesus or the compound name of Jesus Christ. Christ, by the way, is not Jesus' surname. I guess you're all aware of that, are you? (laughs) It wasn't Mary Christ and Joseph Christ gave birth to Jesus Christ. We have no idea what his surname... I don't even know if they had surnames in Israel back then. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, He has that name because of his function, his role. By the way... You'll be aware, I am sure, that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Jesuses in the world. If you go across to South America, Jesus is quite a common name. And in Israel, I would imagine the same would be true. I'm not sure. So when you are offering an important prayer or asking God for some important favour, please remember to use the compound name of Jesus Christ. If we're involved in deliverance ministry and we just say, in Jesus' name, come out, the demon can sit there with his arms folded and say, Jesus who? In the name of Jesus Christ or even better, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, come out. Now you're invoking the name. Now you are bringing the full power and spectrum of Christ's ministry to focus to bear in Jesus' name. When you're praying for the sick, not just in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Because as you're probably aware, sickness is... is, authored by Satan. 
When Jesus came, he came to defeat Satan on two fronts. Who can tell me what the first one is? Sin. Sin. What's the other one? Can he be quiet? <laughs> Sickness. Specifically, the two are named. Sickness and sin. You know, when you pray for someone for a sickness to be driven from them, it's no different absolutely in any way, shape or form than praying for a demon to be driven out. They are both emissaries of Satan. One makes you sick in the body, one makes you sick in the mind. They are both to be treated the same way and they both have to respect the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think sometimes when we don't get response to healing prayer, it's because we are only using half the name that we have been given instead of using the full name of Jesus Christ or even the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. Why are they trying to take Christ out of Christmas? Because the Christ in Christmas is what brings life to the world. Is what brings resurrection to the dead, is what brings healing to the sick, what brings salvation to the lost. We never ever want to let go of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. May your hand of blessing be upon this congregation and fellowship. I pray that as we go from this place, your name, Lord Jesus, would be on our lips. But Father, we remember that we approach you through your beautiful Son, Jesus. The one who allowed himself to be nailed to a cross by his own created beings. The one who died and shed his blood to cleanse us and purify us and prepare a people fit for kingdom living. The one who daily dwells with us through the Holy Spirit, travels with us through life. Jesus, what we must take you through sometimes. I thank you, Lord, that your love is so great, that you love in spite of, not because of. You are the epitome of phileo love. And I pray that we will learn to love you the same way, that we love you in spite of, not because of. When things go well, we'll love you because things are going well. When things are going badly, we'll love you because we know you're in it with us. When we're in triumph, we will love you because if we're in triumph. When we're in apparent defeat, we will love you because we know the real victory is coming tomorrow. We know, Lord Jesus, you are coming with the shout of God and the trump of the archangel. We know we're going to see you descending from heaven and we know we're going to rise to meet with you in the air. And there's nothing that men can do or women can do that will stop that, that will slow that down, that will alter that in any way. And I thank you, Father, that you came back for a church victorious, not a church hanging on by the fingernails, desperately clinging to something. You're coming for a church victorious, and we stand here victorious looking towards you, Lord. And no matter how tough things may be or may get, nevertheless, we proclaim that our Jesus is coming. Our deliverer is coming. And nothing will slow you down. Praise God you're not relying on Australia Post. Thank you, Father. We look to you, the author and perfecter of faith, and we are inspired. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.